All right, this lecture will finish up our discussion of assignment 12.2 from the syllabus, which deals with the general test for factual causation. We know that there's two big tests. One is the but-for test adopted by a majority of jurisdictions and used by the third restatement of torts. The other test is the substantial factor test. This is a minority approach for negligence. It was adopted by the second restatement and it's still retained by California. We've already taken a good look, I think, at the but for test. We've seen that it works pretty well in most cases, especially where there's a direct connection between the defendant's negligent act and the plaintiff's injury. It's perhaps a little less effective in cases involving omissions, where there's an indirect connection between the defendant's act and the plaintiff's harm. So there's one other scenario, though, that we're going to look at for the but for test where there are particular problems. And this is called the independent sufficient cause scenario. Here, the problems are so great, they're actually insurmountable. And so courts wind up dropping the but for test and replacing it with something different. So in this lecture, I'm going to talk about the independent sufficient cause exception to the but for test. And then we'll talk a little bit about the substantial factor test. And in the next lecture, we'll look at some additional exceptional scenarios. These are problem scenarios where either or both tests seem to fail and courts have to create additional solutions. All right, let's take a look at the independent sufficient cause scenario. This is well illustrated by the case of Kingston versus Chicago Northwest Railway. Here we've got a railroad that negligently sparks a fire and that fire begins to grow. And we have another fire with an unknown origin and it also then starts to spread. And at some point, these two fires merge together and the much bigger fire that they create winds up burning down the plaintiff's property. So the question is whether or not the plaintiff can prove factual causation against the railroad for its negligence in starting that first fire. Well, if you apply the but for test, it looks like the plaintiff is going to have a problem. So the question is whether or not the exercise of reasonable care by the railroad would have prevented the fire. And the answer looks like it wouldn't. That even if the railroad had acted reasonably and not emitted that spark, there still was this other unknown fire that presumably would have continued burning and probably would have burned right up to the plaintiff's house and burned it down. And so because the railroad wasn't a but-for cause of the property damage, it looks like the railroad would escape responsibility. Well, that just seems unfair because we know that the railroad in fact was negligent. They need to be punished for their negligence and perhaps we need to set a precedent that deters other railroads from doing the same thing. And so the court needs to find a way to get around the but-for problem in this case. And so it simply says that public policy requires that we shift the burden to the defendant to disprove causation. That is, we know the defendant for policy reasons should be held liable. Now let's see if the defendant can come forward and explain its way out of this case. So that's one approach. And frankly, it's not even the majority approach that jurisdictions will take to the independent sufficient cause situation. What most jurisdictions do is replace the but for test with a substantial factor test. And once you do that, you'll see that we overcome the problem and it, we're able to reach what seems to be a good policy solution. And so our question now is simply whether the railroad's negligence was a substantial factor in burning down the plaintiff's property. And so if you kind of chase the chain, the links in the chain that lead from the defendant's conduct to the um, plaintiff's property damage, you can see that the railroad did start a fire. That fire made a substantial contribution to the bigger fire that ultimately burned down the plaintiff's house. And so in that sense, you can say, yes, the defendant's negligence was a substantial contributing factor to the fire that wound up causing the plaintiff his property damage. So it gets us around the but-for conundrum, and our solution is to simply use the substantial factor test.
All right, let's see if we can extract from the Kingston case some of the factors that you'll look for to identify an independent sufficient cause problem. So we know that there have to be multiple actors whose conduct combines to contribute to the plaintiff's harm. And I'm hoping that the graphic depicted here on the right helps you visualize that. Multiple actors, their conduct comes together and produces some force that then contributes to the plaintiff's harm. Now, each of these acts alone would have been sufficient to cause the plaintiff's harm. Because of that, none of those individual acts is a but-for cause because none was indispensable to the result. Another way of saying that is that the plaintiff would have sustained harm even if, for example, defendant number one had acted reasonably. All the other acts, because they were alone sufficient to bring about that result, um, would have produced it regardless of the defendant's negligence. So that's a problem. And the policy solution here is to shift from the inadequate but-for test to the substantial factor test. And so when you apply the substantial factor test, you hold each defendant responsible for making a substantial contribution to the plaintiff's injury. Now, remember that it does have to be a substantial contribution. In the Kingston case, the court said that the railroad's fire and the unknown fire were basically on equal footing. But the court also suggested that if there was a raging fire that had been started by an unknown source, and let's say an individual had struck a match and tossed that tiny little match into that raging fire, that would look like an insubstantial contribution. Even though there's a kind of combination of acts there, the match being thrust into an already raging fire seems to be so insignificant that you wouldn't hold the person with the match responsible. So once you replace the but-for test with the substantial factor test, you still have to determine whether or not the defendant's negligence made a substantial contribution to the force that caused the plaintiff's injury. So in jurisdictions that have adopted the but-for test, they will replace that test with the substantial factor test in the case involving independent sufficient causes. But some jurisdictions have decided that if the but-for test doesn't work in all situations, then maybe it's just simply better to use the substantial factor test for all negligence analyses. This is the minority approach that had been adopted by the second restatement and that California still applies. Now, there's really not much to the instruction that you would give to the jury. You simply ask whether the defendant's negligence was a substantial factor in producing the plaintiff's harm. There's really built into that test two components. First, the defendant's negligence has to be at least a factor somewhat of a factor in producing the plaintiff's harm. That is, it must have been at least indispensable to bringing it about. But the second part is the evaluative part. That's where we ask, assuming that it is a factor, the question is whether or not it is so substantial that we feel comfortable holding the defendant legally responsible for the resulting injuries. Now, the second restatement doesn't really give a whole lot of guidance about how we determine substantiality. The main test is just whether or not a reasonable person would find the defendant's negligence a substantial factor. Sensing, I think, that most people wouldn't find that um, elaboration very helpful, the second restatement came up with three factors to use to determine what a reasonable person would find to be substantial. The first of these factors is the number of other causes that may have contributed to the plaintiff's harm and the extent of their influence on the plaintiff's injury. So as you can see, this is clearly a comparative analysis. You're trying to compare the defendant's negligence and its contribution to the accident to the contributions that are being made by others. and in making that comparison and weighing them, perhaps you can get a better feeling as to whether the other factors clearly outweigh the defendant's contribution or if the defendant's contribution stands up to and maybe even overpowers 
the um, influence of other causal agents. The second consideration is whether or not the defendant's act or influence was active and direct as opposed to being passive and indirect. And this kind of goes back to our trolley problem that we talked about last night, that where something is active and direct, people are much more likely to say it's substantial. And if it's passive and indirect, it gives an opportunity for other people or other forces to intervene and act upon the plaintiff and cause the plaintiff's harm. The final one is lapse of time, but this also is kind of a comparative analysis because it's really asking whether or not there was an immediacy or directness between the defendant's negligence and the plaintiff's injury, or was there enough of a gap in time that other parties or agencies or forces could have intervened to influence the plaintiff's injury. All right, now let's look at how to apply the substantial factor considerations in a real case. We'll use Brisboy versus fiberboard paper products. Now here we have a gentleman who worked around asbestos for a period of about 26 years, and he had worked for nine different employers. And as a result of that exposure, he wound up developing asbestosis and ultimately cancer, which took his life. So his wife brings a wrongful death action against a multitude of these employers who were all manufacturers of asbestos. Um, most of them settled, but Fiberboard did not, and so Fiberboard is our target defendant in this case. The jury here did find that Fiberboard was negligent, and their negligence was a factual cause of the decedent's death. We're going to be focused primarily on the issue of factual cause. And because this is a substantial factor case, the first thing we have to look at are what are the factors that seem to have contributed to the decedent's death. Now, looking at the defendant side of the case, the decedent did work at the defendant's factory where there was a plentitude of asbestos. And by virtue of his exposure, it looks like the defendant's negligence in failing to control that asbestos dust or provide warnings about it is a contributing cause of our decedent's asbestosis and cancer death. But now looking at the plaintiff, it's also true that the decedent here was a very heavy smoker, that he had smoked two packs of cigarettes a day for over 30 years. And so we've got now a number of possible explanatory factors. So let's th run through the substantial factor considerations. The court really only talks about this first one, that is the number of other causes and the extent of their influence on the plaintiff's harm. And if you start first by looking at the defendant's exposure um, to the fiberboard asbestos, we do know that he worked for them for a period of about six to nine months and was apparently immersed in the asbestos while he was there. That is, he was constantly inhaling the dust at their factory. The evidence did suggest that it doesn't really take a lot of exposure to develop asbestosis and even one month of heavy exposure could have led to asbestosis and from asbestosis could have led to cancer. Now, looking at the smoking, it could be a contributing cause. There were a number of experts who said that either the smoking was the predominant cause or it was at least a contributory cause, which could have exacerbated the deterioration to the decedent's lungs. And so we know that smoking was another one of these factors. But I would raise another question. We know that there were eight other employers that the decedent had worked for over a period of 26 years. We know that he only worked for Fiberboard for less than a year, for six to nine months. And so the question I would raise is whether or not perhaps the decedent had already developed asbestosis from perhaps years of being exposed to that product by other companies before he ever arrived at Fiberboard. If that were true, then the number of other causes could be significantly great and the extent of their influence could be profound.
court didn't really talk about the second factor, that is, if the defendant's negligence was active and direct or passive and indirect, but it does look like it was direct, that while the decedent was in Fiberboard's factory, he was directly inhaling the asbestos fibers into his lungs at their job site. So it looks like we do have a pretty clear connection between their negligence and the way that they conducted their work site and his exposure and ultimately his disease. The last factor is really difficult to evaluate because the case doesn't really give us any information about how long it took for him to develop his cancer. We don't really know at what point in his career that he had worked for Fiberboard. It could have been early in the middle of that career or sometime near the end. And so we have no way of knowing how much time had elapsed between his exposure at Fiberboard and his ultimate death from cancer. But I believe that this is a significant problem. So let's suppose that he had worked for Fiberboard relatively early in his career. It could be perhaps that the lapse of time between that early exposure and his development of cancer 26 years later suggests that it really wasn't the exposure at Fiberboard that did him in. It might have been the remaining time that he worked around asbestos at the factories of other employers that wound up causing his injury. Or consider this. Let's suppose that he worked at Fiberboard near the very end of his career. Isn't it possible that he could have already developed asbestosis from inhaling asbestos dust from all of the other eight employers that he had worked for? In that scenario, it doesn't look like the Fiberboard contribution would be substantial. It looks like perhaps um, this was a foregone conclusion. He had already inhaled so much dust into his lungs that he was going to die of cancer almost no matter what. So it does look to me at least that there were some lingering doubts about some of the factors in the substantial factor analysis. But yet the court here said that ultimately factual cause is a jury question. The jury heard all of the expert testimony and at least in their mind, they believe that there was a sufficient connection between the negligence of fiberboard and the inhalation of asbestos and death by cancer in order to hold fiberboard liable.